All right, everybody. Uh, going to give it one more minute as people continue to roll in, and then we'll get started on this evening's program. want to thank everybody for again joining us for uh, what has been so far a uh, remarkable year uh, and should continue to be so. Um, let's see how we're doing here. Okay, well, let's get started. Uh, so I want to, first of all, welcome everyone to the final program for this academic year of the Participatory Democracy Initiative and the Pitt Family Foundation Speaker Series. Uh, this year, we've hosted Margaret Wrinkle, Thomas Frank, Annette Gordon-Reed, and tonight, Stephen Levitsky. I want to again thank the University of Arizona Law School, uh, Dean Mark Miller, and the Pitt family for allowing us to bring you this program. Uh, the speaker series from the beginning has been centered on engaging some of the country's top thought leaders for meaningful discussion with our community on the challenges and complexities of our current political landscape as it relates to political extremism, polarization, and rebuilding our sense of civic participation without extreme partisanship. It has been and is an opportunity for current U of A students, alumni, and community members to come together, and ask questions, uh, talk about ideas, and uh, be challenged and informed. I think tonight's speaker will engage us on the true challenges we face and how to meet them. Um, his uh, studies have been all about what uh, this program is about. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Dean Mark Miller to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, Dean Miller. Thank you, Jonathan. We're delighted to be joined by the multifaceted Stephen Levitsky, esteemed professor, incisive author, and respected political scientist. He is the David Rockefeller Professor of Latin American Studies and Professor of Government, as well as the director of the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies, both at Harvard University. Professor Levitke's research focuses primarily on democratization and authoritarianism, political parties, and weak and informal institutions, principally with respect to Latin America. Professor Levitsky is also a New York Times bestselling author. His prescient and timely 2018 book, How Democracies Die, co-authored with Daniel Ziblatt, was an international success published in 25 languages. In addition, he has written or edited 11 other books and is in the process of developing another book on multiracial democracy in the United States. A true polymath, Professor Levitsky is a frequent contributor to the New York Times, the Washington Post, Foreign Affairs, Fox, and the New Republic, among other places. In keeping with his area of extensive expertise, his talk today will focus on a particular segment of the American experiment, our transition toward a multiracial democracy, which has invited fervent reactions from those who fear losing control and influence in our political systems. Certainly this type of reactionary movement is neither novel nor unique to the United States. Time and again throughout history, those in power turn to authoritarianism when they no longer find themselves in the majority. Fortunately, perhaps, our constitution leaves us particularly vulnerable to this type of exploitation. As we have recently seen, there are a number of outdated American institutions that appear to enable this type of minority rule. I don't mean to introduce Mr. Levitsky with a depressing intro. Hope is not lost. We are in a powerful and resilient country. And with voices like Professor Levitsky's educating us, we should be better equipped to address the challenges facing American democracy. So our sincere and deep thanks to Donald Pitt and the Pitt Family Foundation and to all of you here today and the many of you who have become regular and active participants in this series Please join me in welcoming Stephen Levitsky as he presents Tyranny of the Minority. Uh, good evening, everybody, or at least this evening out here. Um, many, many thanks for, uh, to Dean Miller, to Professor Rothschild for this uh, invitation. I was looking at the uh, 
the list of previous speakers that you all have had over the last couple of years, and it's a it's a pretty impressive list. So I'm I'm a little worried that it's going to be a little drop off in this in this final um, talk this year. But I'll do my best. As uh, as Dean Miller said, I'm, the talk I'm going to give today is uh, basically a summary of a book that I just completed with Daniel Ziblatt, uh, which is a follow up to How Democracies Die. We just turned in the page proofs today and it'll be out in September. The book is entitled um, Tyranny of the Minority. OK, um, so American democracy is at a crossroads. On the one hand, we stand on the brink of a multiracial democracy, something that very few societies have ever achieved. Uh, and on the other hand, we nearly lost our democracy a couple of years ago. Uh, 10 years ago, the United States uh, received a score of 94 out of 100 on Freedom House's Global Freedom Index, which is a uh, global measure of democracy. That put us on par with Canada and the UK and Germany. Um, Today, decades later, uh, America's score on uh, Freedom House score is 83, which is tied with Panama, tied with Romania, and a notch lower than Argentina. That may seem shocking to you, but when you have widespread efforts to restrict voting, violent threats against election workers, and efforts by an incumbent president to overturn the results of election, you fall to the point where Freedom House considers you less democratic than Argentina. Uh, in our book, Dana and I try to get at the question of why this is happening, what, uh, what has gone wrong. We argue uh, that the United States is undergoing an unprecedented transition, a transition to a multiracial democracy in which a, a, a previously majority ethnic group loses its majority and dominant status. That, as, uh, as Dean Miller mentioned, has, has triggered a fierce authoritarian reaction among a minority of Americans. But that is only half the problem. Our Constitution, which was built to protect us from majorities, not minorities, is making the problem worse. It's making the problem worse by protecting and empowering that authoritarian minority. All right, let us uh, start with the good news. Uh, the United States is in the middle of a really extraordinary transition. It is becoming a genuinely multiracial democracy. Uh, as all of you know, America has grown both much more diverse, but also more racially equal over the last 50 years. And this has dramatically changed the face of American politics. The number of non-white members of Congress in the United States has quadrupled since my bar mitzvah, uh, not that long ago. Since 1980, the number of African-Americans in Congress has increased from 19 to 64. The number of Latino members of Congress has increased from nine to 51. The number of Asian Americans in Congress has increased from 6 to 18. In 1965, as all of you know, all nine Supreme Court justices were white men. Today, four of the justices are white men. Only six of nine are white. Public opinion has also changed dramatically. For the first time ever in the history of this country, a majority of Americans in polls consistently embrace the two core principles of multiracial democracy, racial diversity, and racial equality. So in 1980, going back uh, 40 plus years, most Americans opposed by, uh, laws to ban discrimination in home sales. And the, most Americans favored leaving it up to the homeowner. Today, 80% of Americans support laws to ban discrimination in home sales. In the 1980s, the, a solid majority of Americans opposed affirmative action. Today, Gallup finds that about 60% of Americans consistently support affirmative action. A little over 60% of Americans now in, in uh, various polls agree with the statement that the growing diversity of our society makes America a better place to live. Again, this is an entirely new phenomenon. It is only in the 21st century that majorities in America have embraced ethnic diversity and racial equality. But the transition, this transition to multiracial democracy has confronted or confronts two big challenges, a powerful authoritarian reaction and a constitution that is amplifying that reaction. I'm going to take each of these obstacles in turn. First of all, uh, when Dan and I wrote How Democracies Die, I guess we wrote it five years ago, we did not consider the Republican Party 
uh, an authoritarian party. In fact, we said so in the book. History, unfortunately, forced us to revise that view. Political parties that are committed to democracy, or what the political scientist Juan Linz described or called loyal Democrats, parties that are committed to democracy, must do three things. First of all, they must unambiguously accept the results of elections, win or lose. Secondly, they must unambiguously reject the use of political violence. And third, they must break completely and unambiguously with anti-democratic extremists. First two points are pretty obvious, but I want to develop this third point, breaking with extremists. Openly authoritarian figures, coup conspirators, violent insurrectionists, they usually tend to be pretty few in number. And by themselves, they're almost never strong enough to kill a democracy. But democracy's assassins always have accomplices. And those accomplices are almost always mainstream politicians who enable them. These are what Juan Linz called semi-loyal Democrats, semi-loyal Democrats. Semi-loyal Democrats don't look like authoritarians. They're not wearing fatigues. They're not carrying AR-15s. They rarely engage in visibly authoritarian acts. So when democracies die, you don't find the semi-loyalist fingerprints on the murder weapon. But semi-loyalists play a crucial role in enabling authoritarians. That enabling can take several different forms. Semi-loyalists may help to legitimize or normalize anti-democratic extremists by appearing with them in public, by forging alliances with them. They may condone or justify anti-democratic behavior in the media. They may protect anti-democratic extremists from legal prosecution, for polit from political expulsion. One thing we know, one lesson that, we, that, that was crystal clear coming out of the breakdowns of democracy in Europe in the 1930s and in South America in the 1960s and 70s, is that when mainstream political parties of the center left or the center right begin to tolerate, to protect, to enable anti-democratic extremists, democracies get into trouble. So how do we tell a loyal Democrat from a semi-loyal Democrat? The real litmus test I want to suggest is when anti-democratic extremists appear on one's own political flank, on one's, in one's own ideological camp. It's easy to denounce someone on the other camp as a fascist or a communist or an authoritarian, but when a, uh, a faction or a leader or a movement within your own camp emerges that challenges democracy, that's the real test. So when faced with anti-democratic extremists on their own flank, Loyal Democrats do four things. First of all, they publicly condemn anti-democratic behavior, and they often work to hold those who commit anti-democratic acts responsible. Secondly, loyal Democrats expel anti-democratic extremists from their ranks, refusing to nominate them for higher office, refusing to allow them to hold office. Third, loyal Democrats sever all ties, private ties, public ties, with any allied groups that engage in anti-democratic behavior. They completely break with them. And finally, when it is necessary, loyal Democrats are willing to join forces with pro-democratic forces, small d democratic forces, from across the political spectrum, including ideological rivals, in order to isolate and defeat anti-democratic extremists. So Democrats, small d Democrats on the left, will join forces with those on the right to defeat the extremists. Semi-loyal Democrats never do any of those things. Rather than publicly repudiate anti-democratic behavior, um, they will downplay, they will deny um, such behavior. They may blame violence, for example, on false flag operations. They may justify it through whataboutism, or they may simply remain silent. Rather than expelling anti-democratic extremists, semi-loyalists will tolerate them, will accommodate them, will even quietly sometimes collaborate with them. Uh, they may disapprove of these extremists in private, but they're unwilling to publicly oppose them and publicly hold them accountable. And finally, semi-loyal Democrats are unwilling to work with ideological rivals to isolate extremists, even when democracy is on the line. The tragedy of semi-loyalty is that it's driven by normal political ambition. 
semi-loyalists are not trying to kill democracy. They're just careerists who are trying to get ahead. They tolerate authoritarian behavior basically out of political experience, uh, expedience, excuse me, or because it's politically the path of least resistance. But in so doing, they can become indispensable partners in democracy's demise. Since 2020, much to Daniel and my surprise, the Republican Party has violated all three of these principles of loyal democratic behavior. They did not unambiguously accept the results of the 2020 election. Not only was Donald Trump the first sitting U.S. president to refuse to accept defeat and attempt to overturn an election, but crucially, much more dangerous than that, the bulk of the Republican Party went along with it. A group called the Republican Accountability Project, a group of, of never Trumpers, uh, evaluated the public statements of all 260 Republican members of Congress, House and Senate, to see whether they made statements casting doubts on the legitimacy of the 2020 election. So in the, in the weeks and months after the election, what did they say publicly about the election? 86% of those Republican members of Congress made statements that cast doubts on the election. I cannot stress to you enough how dangerous this is. Democracy requires that parties know how to lose. When a major party cannot accept defeat, democracy is in trouble. Republicans have also begun to flirt with political violence. Republican leaders embraced individuals who threatened or killed Black Lives Matter protesters in 2020. The, the McCloskeys, the, the St. Louis couple who drew their weapons on unarmed Black Lives Matter protesters in the summer of 2020 were given a prominent speaking role in the Republican convention that year. Kyle Rittenhouse was nominated by Republicans for a congressional gold medal. And during the 2022 primary season, the New York Times found that more than 100 Republican ads uh, featured candidates who brandished or fired guns. I can think of no other major party in any established democracy in which candidates so openly embraced violence. But far and away, the most dangerous, at least to me, feature of the contemporary Republican Party is its refusal to break with the forces that have openly threatened U.S. democracy. Although open election deniers and advocates of violence remain a pretty small minority in the Republican Party leadership. Semi-loyalists are now pervasive. Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy knew that Joe Biden won the 2020 election. By most accounts, they were pretty troubled by Trump's uh, anti-democratic behavior. But they enabled it anyway. They protected, they protected Trump from accountability by refusing to impeach and convict him. They blocked creation of an independent commission to investigate the January 6th investigation. And they continue to this day to say they will support him if he's the Republican nominee in 2024. This is what Daniel and I call the banality of authoritarianism. McCarthy, McConnell, other mainstream Republicans did not actively try to kill democracy. They simply concluded that their short-term political ambitions were better served by enabling Trump's authoritarianism. McConnell believed that convicting Trump and creating an independent uh, January 6th commission would hurt his party's chances of winning back control of the Senate. And McCarthy knew that if he alienated Trump supporters in the House, he'd never become speaker. So Republican leaders refused to unambiguously accept defeat, began to flirt with political violence, and tolerated, even enabled, anti-democratic extremists. Now, importantly, I am not saying that all Republicans are authoritarian. Far from it. Mo many, many, many most, in fact, obviously, are not. But looking at the behavior of Republican leaders since 2020, it is hard not to conclude that the party as a whole is no longer committed to basic democratic rules of the game. So why is this happening? Why would a mainstream political party that's been competing in elections for 150 years suddenly lose the ability to lose? Arguably, for political parties to accept defeat, for them to easily accept defeat, two conditions have to hold. First of all, parties have to believe they stand a chance of winning again in the future. 
And secondly, the stakes have to be reasonably low. In other words, parties have to believe that losing will not bring ruinous consequences. When politicians fear that they're not going to be able to win future elections, or maybe more importantly, when they or their constituents believe that defeat will bring catastrophe, then the stakes rise. Politicians' time horizons narrow, and they start to play to win at any cost. In other words, we argue that it's an outsized fear of losing that leads parties to turn away from democracy. Think about Southern Democrats after the Civil War. Reconstruction was our country's first experiment with multiracial democracy. It brought widespread Black enfranchisement. African Americans were an outright majority or a near majority in most Southern states. So their enfranchisement terrified Southern Democrats and many of their supporters. Not only did Black suffrage threaten Southern Democrats' electoral dominance, but it threatened the entire racial order in the South. In the face of what they viewed as an existential threat, the Democrats abandoned any pretense of democracies. One North Carolina Democrat uh, declared in public, we cannot outnumber the Negroes, and so we must either outcheat, outcount, or outshoot them. And that's what they did. The Democrats used a combination of violent terror and election fraud to seize power across the South in the 1870s, and then they entrenched themselves in power by restricting the vote. All 11 post-Confederate states used uh, passed constitutional amendments and laws that enabled the use of poll taxes, literacy tests, and property and residence requirements to effectively eliminate African Americans' voting rights. So black turnout in the South fell from 61% in 1880 to 2% in 1912. Unwilling to lose, Southern Democrats stripped the right to vote from nearly half the population, ushering in nearly a century of authoritarian rule in the South. We fear something similar, or at least a similar dynamic, is occurring within the Republican Party today. The Republicans are a party of a majority ethnic group, white Christians, whose electoral and social dominance has come under threat. The origins of this problem go way back. The origins of this problem go back to the Civil Rights Revolution of the 1950s and the 1960s. That was our country's second experiment with multiracial democracy. At that time, in the 1950s and 60s, the Republicans were a minority party, but the Democrats' embrace of civil rights alienated many of their racially conservative white voters. That was especially true in the South, where the vast majority of white voters were Democrats. That created an electoral opportunity for the Republicans, it gave the Republicans an opportunity to become the majority party. Um, and beginning with Goldwater, Continuing with Nixon and Reagan, Republicans systematically appealed to white and later evangelical white voters who disliked policies aimed at achieving racial equality. The strategy worked. Southern whites went from being overwhelmingly Democrats in the 1960s to being overwhelmingly Republicans in the early 21st century. And as a result, the Republicans became the dominant party among white and particularly white evangelical voters. The Republican Party has won the white vote, it's won the, the most votes among whites in every single presidential election since 1968. It's won the white vote in 14 consecutive presidential elections. Now, being the dominant party among white Christian voters was a huge advantage in the 1970s and the 1980s when white Christians were about 80% of the US electorate. The Republicans won every single presidential election between 1968 and 1988, except for one, except for the 1976 Watergate election. But being America's white Christian party became a problem in the 21st century as the white Christian share of the electorate declined. So in 1980, Ronald Reagan won 55% of the white vote and turned that into a landslide 44 state victory. In 2012, a little over a generation later, Mitt Romney won an even more overwhelming 59% of the white vote, but still lost the election. When Republicans realized that they were winning the white vote but losing the American vote, they started 
Japan. But the problem, and this is really important, the problem was not just losing elections. The real problem was that many rank and file Republicans began to view defeat as catastrophic. For much of the Republican base, the rise of multiracial democracy felt like an existential threat. White Christians were not just any group. Historically, they had occupied the top rung on all of this country's social, economic, political, cultural hierarchies. For two centuries, every single president, every single vice president, every single House Speaker, Senate Majority Leader, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Federal Reserve Chair, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was a white man. All the way through the mid-1980s, every single governor, every single Fortune 500 CEO, every single Miss America was white. White Christians define this country's national identity. All of that is now ending rapidly, relentlessly, and right before our eyes. We're seeing it, for example, in soaring rates of interracial dating and interracial marriage. We see it in the growing presence of non-white and mixed, white, uh, mixed race families in popular culture, on, on, in movies, television screens. We see it in declining societal tolerance for racist behavior. We see it in challenges in the classroom, in the newsroom, to historical narratives that used to downplay or ignore America's racist past. And of course, we saw it in the election of a black president and a black vice president. We are witnessing in a, in a short period of time, in a period of a few decades, an unprecedented un assault on this country's racial hierarchies. For those who were born and raised on the top of those hierarchies, this can feel like an existential threat. Many Republican voters, not all, many Republican voters feel like they're on the brink, not just of losing elections, but losing their country. They feel like the country they grew up in is being taken away from them. And that sense of loss has pushed many rank and file Republicans toward extremism. In a poll out that you may have seen early last year, 56% of Republicans agreed with the statement that the traditional American way of life is disappearing so fast that we may have to use force to save it, 56%. Now, the Republicans' radicalization would pose less of a threat, less of a problem, if the United States were like other democracies, where electoral majorities govern. Again, most Americans embrace the core principles of multiracial democracy. Polls consistently show majority support for immigration, for ethnic diversity, for voting rights, for Black Lives Matter. But this new multiracial democratic majority has hurled itself against some of the world's most powerful counter-majoritarian institutions. Now, we tend to think of counter-majoritarian institutions as essential to democracy, and some of them are. Modern democracy absolutely requires the protection of minority rights. Not everything can or should be up for grabs in an election. As Justice Robert Jackson famously put it, some domains must be placed beyond the reach of majorities. Daniel and I argue that two domains in particular must be beyond the reach of majorities. The first is basic civil rights. Civil liberties like the right to vote, free speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of association have to be protected from the whims of the majority. So should many of our individual life choices. Elected governments shouldn't determine whether and how we worship, should not determine what books we read, should not determine the race or the gender of the people that we marry. So individual rights is one domain that must be roped off from majorities. The second domain that has to be beyond the reach of majorities is the democratic process itself. Elected governments can't be able to use popular majorities or uh, parliamentary majorities to entrench themselves in power, for example, by changing the rules of the game to weaken the opposition or to undermine fair competition. This is the sort of classic problem of, of majority tyranny, like we saw in Chavez's Venezuela, in Orban's Hungary, possibly now in Israel. So we need to have mechanisms to protect the democratic system from majorities that would subvert it. These two rights, the basic civil liberties and the right to fair competition, are what I would call essential minority rights. And institutions that protect those rights include the U.S. Bill of Rights, an independent judiciary with at least some constitutional review power, 
and relatively high barriers to constitutional reform, super majorities rather than simple majorities to change the constitution. Those counter majoritarian institutions are what I would call essential counter majoritarian institutions. Democracy can't live without them. But other counter majoritarian institutions are not essential to democracy. In fact, some of them undermine democracy. Democracies at the end of the day are supposed to empower majorities. If they don't do that, they're not democracies. So just as some domains must be placed beyond the reach of majorities, other domains, I would argue, have to be within the reach of majorities. And I just wanna mention two domains that must be within the reach of majorities. One of them is elections. Those with more votes should prevail over those with fewer votes in determining who holds political office. There is no theory of liberal democracy that justifies any other outcome than that. A second domain that should always been with, be within the reach of majorities is uh, legislation, policymaking. Those who win elections should govern. Partisan minorities should not be able to permanently veto legislation that's backed by parliamentary majorities, provided that that legislation doesn't violate basic minority rights. Institutions that prevent electoral majorities from winning or that prevent parliamentary majorities from governing are not essential to democracy. In fact, they are antithetical to democracy. The United States, it turns out, has an unusual number of these undemocratic counter-majoritarian institutions. The Electoral College, which allows losers of the popular vote to win the presidency. A severely malapportioned Senate, which provides equal representation to all states regardless of their population. The Senate filibuster, which allows a partisan minority to permanently back, uh, block, excuse me, block legislation backed by a majority. Any powerful Supreme Court with extensive review powers and lifetime tenure for justices, which allows justices appointed in one generation to thwart majorities, potentially for generations to come. Now, Americans tend to think about counter-majoritarian institutions as part of a sort of carefully calibrated system of checks and balances designed by far-sighted constitutional framers. And our, far, our constitutional framers were brilliant figures. But many of our counter-majoritarian institutions, when you go back and look, were actually negotiated concessions made during the Philadelphia Convention concessions to small states, in some cases, concessions to slaveholding states that threatened to potentially break up the union. This was a pact. These were negotiations to prevent the breakup of the union. So the structure of the Senate was a concession to small states that threatened to bolt the union if they were not given equal representation. Both Hamilton and Madison opposed equal representation in the Senate. Madison called it evidently unjust, and he voted against it. The Electoral College was an improvised second best solution after all the other alternatives had been voted down. Madison himself preferred direct presidential elections, but Southern slave states feared being outvoted by the North and rejected direct presidential elections. The Senate filibuster, of course, is not in the Constitution. It emerged basically by accident several decades later, but it is worth noting that both Hamilton and Madison strongly opposed supermajority rules for regular legislation. Madison wrote that if, he, if more than a simple majority were required to pass legislation, and I quote him now, the fundamental principle of free government would be reversed. It would no longer be the majority that would rule. The power would be transferred to the minority. I want to suggest that this set of counter-majoritarian institutions now threatens U.S. democracy. The concessions that were made to small states back in the 18th century built a small state bias into our political system. It overrepresented sparsely populated territories. So the Electoral College favors sparsely populated states. The U.S. Senate heavily favors sparsely populated states. And because the Senate approves Supreme Court nominees, the Supreme Court is also somewhat biased towards sparsely populated states. Now that rural bias has always been there and it's always been undemocratic, but it has never seriously advantaged one political party over another party 
because for most of American history, for two centuries, both of the major parties had urban and rural wings. It is only in the 21st century that American parties have been split along urban versus rural lines. Today, as you all know, the Democrats are overwhelmingly based in metropolitan centers. The Republicans are overwhelmingly based in uh, sparsely populated territories. That gives the Republican Party, through no fault of its own, a systematic advantage in the Electoral College, in the Senate, in the Supreme Court, which crucially allows them to win and to hold national power without winning electoral majorities. Let me run through some pretty well-known data. Uh, Republicans have won the popular vote for president once since 1988. They've won the popular vote for president once since 1988, yet they controlled the presidency for most of the 21st century. A popular majority was not enough for Joe Biden to win the presidency in 2020. He had to win the popular vote by at least four points, and he'll need to win by another four points to retain the presidency in 2024. The Senate's even more skewed. In recent years, the Democrats have needed to win the popular vote by about five points to retain control over the Senate. So even if Democrats consistently win 51, 52% of the national Senate vote, Republicans will control the Senate. Senators, as you know, are elected to staggered six-year terms, and a third of the chamber is up for election every two years. That means it takes three elections for a six-year cycle to fully renovate the Senate. The Democratic Party has won the overall popular vote in every six-year cycle since 2000, and yet the Republicans have controlled the Senate for nearly half that period. In 2016, as you all know, the Democrats won the popular vote for the presidency, and they won the popular vote for the Senate, and yet the Republicans won control of the presidency and the Senate. That's minority rule. Composition of the Supreme Court is also pretty skewed. Four out of nine Supreme Court justices, Thomas, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, Coney Barrett, were confirmed by senators who represented less than half the U.S. population. Three of them, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, Coney Barrett, were nominated by a president who lost the popular vote and were then confirmed by senators who represented less than half the population. If the popular vote determined who controlled the presidency and the Senate, the Supreme Court today likely would have a 6-3 liberal majority. You often hear America described as stalemated today between two evenly matched parties. So phenomena like polarization and gridlock are attributed to an unusual degree of parity. Presidential elections are decided by razor thin margins. The Senate is evenly split. But that parity, I just want to remind you, is manufactured by our institutions. The Democrats have won the popular vote in all but one presidential election since the 1980s. They've won every, the popular vote in every six year cycle in the Senate since the late 1990s. That is not parity. Parity only emerges after our votes pass through the distortionary channels of our institutions. But I wanna suggest that our excessively counter majoritarian institutions are doing more than just thwarting electoral majorities. They may also be reinforcing authoritarianism. Couple of ways. First of all, our institutions reinforce Republican uh, extremism by shielding the party from competitive pressure. Democratic competition is supposed to work something like the market. When products don't sell, firms lose money. When firms lose money, they come under pressure to refine and develop better products. Likewise, in democracies, parties are supposed to win elections. When parties repeatedly lose elections, they adapt and they try to broaden their appeal. So when the Democrats lost three consecutive presidential elections, 1980, 84, and 88, they moved to the center. They picked Bill Clinton, a moderate, to run as their candidate in 1992. They tried to broaden their appeal. That process of adaptation isn't happening in the Republican Party today. Again, the Republicans have lost a popular vote in seven of eight presidential elections. They badly underperformed in 2018, in 2020, in 2022. And yet so far there has been no serious effort to moderate or to rethink strategy. And that is in part 
because our institutions give the Republicans an electoral crutch. They don't have to win national majorities. They can win 47, 48% of the vote. So extremism doesn't cost them in the same way that it would in a truly competitive environment. Think about it, despite all the craziness, despite January 6th, election denial, QAnon, Trump's indictments, despite all of that, national power remains tantalizingly within reach for the Republican Party. They are very likely to win control of the Senate in 2024. And at this point, they've got a coin flips chance of winning the presidency. If Republicans truly had to win national majorities, 50 plus percent of the national electorate to wield power, they would face much, much greater pressure to rein in their, their, their extremism. There's also a danger, I think, that our counter-majoritarian institutions will trigger a sort of self-reinforcing dynamic that effectively locks in minority rule. Again, some review. Republicans won the presidency and the Senate in 2016, despite losing the popular vote. Trump and the Senate, those two institutions, then filled three Supreme Court vacancies. The Supreme Court, in turn, enabled state-level authoritarianism. They upheld egregious gerrymandering schemes that permitted minority rule in Wisconsin and several other state legislatures. Trump's allies hoped to use those legislatures to steal a national election. If the Supreme Court were to endorse the so-called independent legislatures doctrine, gerrymandered state legislatures could potentially ignore the pres uh, presidential election, um, ignore the results of presidential elections, send their own electors to the Electoral College and overturn a national election. That last step remains very unlikely to happen. But the fact that it's even theoretically possible shows how prone the United States is to minority rule. Now, I want to suggest that minority rule or the threat of minority rule is a uniquely American phenomenon. In no other established democracy can partisan minorities thwart electoral majorities as consistently or as consequentially as in the United States. Why is that the case? Excessive counter-majoritarianism used to be the norm. It used to be the widespread in the West. In 19th century Europe, states had all sorts of undemocratic institutions. They had monarchic vetoes. They had indirect elections. They had unelected or badly malapportioned legislative chambers. And most of them had filibuster-like mechanisms through which parliamentary minorities could thwart majorities. But other established democracies across the world gradually shed their pre-democratic institutions. Britain weakened the House of Lords, stripping it of its veto power. Denmark, Sweden, New Zealand, Portugal got rid of their undemocratic upper chambers. Uh, Germany, Austria, Belgium democratized their senates by making them more proportional to the population, senators proportional to the population. Uh, Britain, Canada, Australia, France, and other countries established cloture rules allowing a simple legislative majority to end debate. And Germany, Switzerland, and France imposed term limits on Supreme Court justices, while Canada, Sweden, the UK, and other democracies established a retirement age for justices. Finally, every other presidential democracy on earth got rid of its electoral college. Argentina was the last one in 1994. So other democracies around the world have become more democratic over the last century. They have eliminated 18th and 19th century institutions that allowed minorities to systematically thwart majorities. Only the United States has maintained many of its pre-democratic institutions intact. So today, the United States is the world's only presidential democracy with an electoral college. We have the most malapportioned Senate in the world, except for Argentina and Brazil. No other democracy allows a congressional minority to routinely veto regular legislation backed by a majority. And the United States is the only established democracy with truly lifetime appointments to the Supreme Court. Every other established democracy either has term limits or a mandatory retirement age. So the US is an outlier. It is uniquely counter-majoritarian. And that explains, at least in part, why U.S. democracy seems to be uniquely threatened 
among Western democracies. The rise of multiracial democracy triggered an authoritarian reaction among a partisan minority in this country. But in the US more than any other Western democracy, counter majoritarian institutions have protected and empowered that minority. They have amplified the authoritarian reaction. So what can we do? In the short term, I believe we continue to face a fairly imminent authoritarian threat. It is therefore imperative that politicians, that our small d democratic politicians, build broad coalitions in defense of democracy, coalitions that are big enough to isolate and politically defeat uh, the MAGA movement. Those coalitions have to, have to range from Bernie Sanders and AOC on the left to Liz Cheney, George Bush, conservative religious and business figures. It has to be a very, very broad coalition. That's not happening today. And it's not happening because it's not easy to do. Building a broad coalition requires sacrifice. People like Mitt Romney and Liz Cheney have to work to elect Democrats. They're lifelong Republicans. That is hard to do. And progressives have to make the, the policy concessions necessary to bring conservatives on board. That's also something that many are unwilling to do. That's a big ask of people. But these are not ordinary times. If we behave as if these were ordinary times, if our politicians continue to behave as if these were ordinary times, we could lose our democracy. In the longer term, we need to democratize American democracy. We need to create a system that allows electoral majorities to consistently win power and govern. That means entrenching voting rights. It means ensuring equal access to the ballot for all. It means replacing the electoral college with direct presidential elections. It means democratizing the Senate by eliminating the filibuster and giving more populous states greater representation. And it means establishing, I think, term limits for Supreme Court justices. These are not radical reforms. They already exist in most established democracies. Making it easier to vote, eliminating the electoral college, eliminating the filibuster, making the Senate more proportional, ending lifetime tenure in the Supreme Court, each one of those measures would simply bring us in line with other established democracies. Problem, of course, is that constitutional change is nearly impossible because the United States Constitution is the most difficult among democracies in the world to reform. So for the moment, we are trapped by our institutions. But I think it is critical, it is absolutely critical that we begin a serious public conversation about constitutional reform. Again, we stand at a crossroads. America will either be a multiracial democracy in the 21st century, or it will not be a democracy. Both of those roads continue to lie before us, and I'm pretty sure there's no going back. Let me stop there. Thank you. Okay. Well, that, that doesn't get us thinking, and I'm not sure quite what will. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to start with a question that rose towards the end, but really segues with your closing remarks. Um, will the demographic changes that are underway in this country that you talked about overcome our um, sort of creeping or our, our ingrained minority rule, or do we need a new constitutional convention to enable majority rule? Uh, and what could be the dangers of that? Those are, uh, those are great questions. So um, demographic change might save us. It might. Uh, there's, there, uh, and it's not just demographic change. It's also, importantly, generational change. Um, younger folks, particularly uh, Gen Z, are much, much more tolerant when it comes to racial diversity than any other generation before them. So there is reason to think uh, that as the electorate changes over time, uh, the, the, the multiracial democratic majority will grow and be able to, to win despite counter-majoritarian institutions. But it's, there's no guarantee. There for, for at least two reasons. One, um, political identities are malleable, they're changeable. One never knows uh, exactly how, which, what, 
which political appeals will weaken or 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 uh, uh, or crystallize new identities. There is, no, as the, the the famous slogan is, "Demography is not destiny." That is true. We don't know for sure. You you cannot map contemporary demographics onto future voting patterns. Politics has a way of changing. So we don't know for sure. The other thing is we don't know um, institutional changes, rule changes can at the very least slow down the progress of this multiracial democratic majority. I think Joe Biden was exaggerated when he called efforts to restrict voting uh, in, in a number of red states, Jim Crow 2.0. But it's it's done. The, the the logic is similar. There's an effort to uh, restrict the um, the vote, particularly of young people and non-white voters. Um, and so, the you know the, whether it is um, uh, voting rights, voting access, we don't know the degree to which institution institutional change in the years to come. Uh, Uh, the degree to which they will thwart majority rule. So there is a, there is a chance that we'll sort of muddle through, and demographic change will will kind of get us across the threshold to consolidate multiracial democracy. There's no guarantee. I'm not in favor of a constitutional convention. I think we should retain the existing constitution. It is um, very legitimate. It is very old. It is very stable. It has long been very effective. I my preference, although it's extraordinarily difficult. Um, is to is to make individual amendments to the Constitution rather than call a convention. Okay. Uh, you addressed to some extent earlier the role of the Supreme Court in the decline of democracy, and if you want to expand on that, but that this question had two elements to it: one, the role of the Supreme Court, but the other, the role of Citizens United. Uh, what role do you think Citizens United has played in? what you're seeing is this potential decline? Um, so the there's a lot of evidence that uh, political scientists usually think that the Supreme Court, um, at least there's, there's one, one strand in political science that, that believes that the Supreme Court, for, for the sake of his own legitimacy, never strays too far from majority public opinion. So you don't have to worry so much about the, the, the court going too far to the left or too far to the right. It seems to me that in recent years that um, has not been the case. And there is a, a, a pretty clearly a, a, a vast gap between the current behavior of the Supreme Court and, um, and, and public opinion. And uh, Citizen United is, um, I, I think one such ruling, there are rulings on, on guns, on, on, uh, on uh, voting rights, obviously abortion that uh, are similar. The, the, the effect of Citizen United is, I don't want to downplay it, it's somewhat orthogonal to the threat that we, there, that we are focusing on in this book. There are many ways for a democracy to die. There are many ways for a democracy to get sick. The role of money in politics is clearly a uh, a uh, an ailment, a serious ailment to, to American democracy. Right? It, it it means that the um, the uh, the acts that Americans have nothing remotely like equal access to our our, our politicians or equal influence. So. There's no question that Citizens United is, is detrimental to democracy. I don't think that it is necessary. Even Dan and I disagree on this a little bit. I don't think there's a direct relationship between Citizens United, which sort of empowered the Koch brothers and many of their allies, and the contemporary radicalization of the Republican Party. Because the, the Trumpization, the MAGA movement, emerged in opposition to the big money in the party. Um, it, it's well funded, but mostly by small, medium sized donors. So I think you would have had MAGA even without uh, without Citizens United. In fact, the you know, even though I'm I, I think there, there ought to be campaign much stricter campaign finance regulations as other democracies have the role of social media and of small donations 
is, I think, at least to some degree, beginning to attenuate the impact of big money. I mean, that it was un, if you go back 10, 20 years, it was unthinkable, unthinkable that Bernie Sanders could out fundraise Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden. But that happens today. Um, the biggest funded Republicans couldn't even come close to defeating Donald Trump. So the impact of, because of, the, of social media in particular, the impact of money, obviously still there, um, but it's not quite what we feared it would be a decade ago. Uh, let, let me take you over to social media for a minute. I think when, you know, uh, the social media movement, we'll call it, began uh, Facebook and Instagram and TikTok now, whatever you want to call it, people thought that was going to be a great uh, boon to democracy, more ideas, more discussion back and forth. Um, but um, I'm not sure it's worked that way. Uh, what do you see of, is the role of social media and information access in whether is that helping us get to more democracy or is that in some ways hurting us? I'm pretty sure it's both. And I think that's often the case with media tech. I mean, that's, that, that's maybe not a satisfying answer, but um, most mass media technologies are, um, turn out to be double-edged for, for democracy and for politics. Um, we were very worried about radio in the 1930s and its impact. Um, we were very worried about television and demagoguery, maybe it did bring demagoguery, but, um, and, and, you know, there's reason to be concerned about social media as well. The, um, so I guess, let me say, uh, two things. And I'm, I'm not quite as alarmist as, as some about the impact of social media, but first of all, there is pretty good evidence that there's been a lot of research in political psychology in the last decade or so that shows that our fears about social media are mostly true. It does seem to have a, um, a silo effect. It does seem to, uh, to radicalize us, to polarize us, to shut us off from dialogue or even access to, um, to other ideas, um, and to guide us um, only the information that we want to see rather than a, a diversity of views. So it, it, it has all those impacts and it does seem to be reinforcing extremism, to be polarizing people, at least among people who are politically engaged. And remember, that's not a huge number of Americans, but among people who are politically engaged, it does have really largely the effect that people fear. That said, we have to remember that, this, that social media is not the cause of our country's polarization. Right. It um, polarization can happen and does happen without social media. The United States descended into civil war in the 1860s without Facebook. Spain fell into civil war in the 1930s without Twitter. Uh, Chile's democracy polarized and collapsed in the 1970s without YouTube. Um, I think as social media is an exacerbate. It's a problem. And I think we, we, we need to, to take steps to learn how to regulate it. But it's not, we have to remember that it's not the underlying cause of the problem. The underlying cause of the problem is societal, not technological. Uh, we've just got, a, as I predicted, an overwhelming amount of questions. I'm going to try to, I, I don't, we don't want to play rapid fire here, but uh, I'll just run through some ideas. What about ranked choice voting? I think it's a good, I, I prefer proportional representation. Uh, 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 a, a list style system, which would be a more radical change for ranked choice voting. But I think ranked choice voting would, it, there, there's some initial evidence that it would have the desired effect of, uh, of strengthening the hand of more moderate um, candidates and have at least a somewhat depolarizing effect. So compared to the status quo, I'm in favor of ranked choice voting, and I hope that more uh, states will begin to experiment with it. Okay. And uh, the importance of class differences, but maybe more specifically, the widening income gap between the wealthy and the, and the poor. So there is a um, debate among 
social scientists about uh, regarding how much class matters, how much of what's going on today is um, driven by uh, increasing income inequality and in particular declining social mobility and those who think this is mostly about uh, race and or culture. I think it's pretty clear that it is that both of these things are going on. Um, Daniel and I focus primarily, as you can tell from the talk, on the role of uh, race and culture. But there's no question in my mind that were the United had the United States maintained the level of social equality and social mobility that we had in the middle part of the 20th century, there would be fewer Americans who were uh, open to to sort of extremist and resentment based politics. So clearly both are, are going on. Uh, you uh, referenced four major problems you identified uh, leading to the decline of democracy. Of those four, uh, what do you consider to be the most dangerous and how could it be eliminated? Wait, which of the, I make, I make too many lists. Which, <laughs> which four are we referring to? I'd have to go back to the, the, uh, well, I, I can tell you, I can tell you uh, on another side of that is uh, I've seen where you've talked about two solutions uh, being mutual toleration and institutional restraint. Uh, yeah. Make a lot of sense. Uh, and you talk somewhat about institutional restraint. Um, mutual toleration and institutional restraint don't seem like thrilling uh, things to go out and run on a campaign platform off on, although they should be. So how, how do we how do we get people there? Oof, it's a good question. I mean, we so our our first book in 2018 focused a lot on what we call democratic norms, unwritten rules of politics that are really important to making democracy work. One of them is uh, ex always both in public and in private, accepting your rival as a legitimate rival, not an enemy. Um, and that was just uh, what you call mutual toleration. And secondly, uh, restraint, being uh, willing to uh, restrain oneself from using the letter of the law in ways that subvert the spirit of the law. It's very, one can kill a democracy entirely legally um, by engaging in what we call, or what Mark Tushnet calls, constitutional hardball, using the letter of the law to subvert its spirit. The thing is, when politics polarizes, these norms get shredded. And we wrote about the sort of the, the weakening of these norms back five, six years ago. And unfortunately, you know, they those norms in the United States have mostly shattered in the in the six years since we wrote our book. The level of mutual toleration uh, today is much lower even than we were wringing our hands about it in 2017. And the level of constitutional hardball has only gotten harder. I mean, if, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So in, in a context of the, the, unfortunately, the problem is not the, the norm so much as the, as the, is the polarization that uh, underlies it because, and this is coming from below, right? If, if, if your constituent, if you're a politician and your constituents believe that the other part, and there's data that, public opinion data that shows this, if you believe that that if your constituents believe that the other party is a threat to the nation, is a threat to national security, is going to destroy the country, um, you're you're not going to get any credit for engaging in mutual toleration. You're going to want to treat them as an existential threat, and you're not going to get any credit for using forbearance or restraint. You're going to want to use every weapon available to you to beat those guys. And so in a context of extreme polarization, unfortunately, I think these norms are, are out the window. And uh, until we find a way to reduce polarization, I don't think we can think seriously about rebuilding those norms. I think we have time for about three more questions. Going back to the last question, our, our uh, listener uh, gave us a prompt uh, with regard to those big problems. Uh, one had to do with... Uh, popular vote to determine elections, I think the Electoral College, second was the filibuster, and the third was the non-representation of the Senate. Uh, 
What do you think is the biggest issue of those three? Good question. Um, I think that the biggest problem of those is the most difficult to resolve, which is the um, disproportionality of the of the Senate. Um, 20 states can um, wait a second. You can get a majority of the Senate. Sorry about the 20 states. You can get a majority of the Senate with 20 percent of the population. Uh, that is a very, very unrepresentative body. Uh, and, and given the, rural, the urban rural split, it's, it's going to be increasingly dangerous for our democracy. The problem is it, is it is literally impossible or it is virtually impossible to change the structure of the Senate because the Constitution states that all states must agree uh, in unanimity to reform the structure of the Senate in order to do so. So it is almost impossible. Uh, the easiest one to change, and, I, and I'm pretty sure it's going to change, is the, the, the filibuster. I think um, it's just a matter of time be, before a majority party, it might be the Democrats, it might be the Republicans, eliminate the, the filibuster. I'm willing to bet you at least a dollar that if Trump wins the presidency and the Republicans win the Senate, McConnell will be under extraordinary pressure to end the filibuster. Um, so I think that's actually going soon, but the other ones are much, much harder. And I think um, of, the, of the ones that I listed and you asked about, the, the structure of the Senate is, is the most serious problem. Um, what about voter apathy and a citizen's duty as citizens of this country to at least minimally participate and be educated in our democracy and vote? And you know, we have some of the lowest voter turnouts anywhere in the world. Uh, what do we do about that? And, and, and would that help? It would help uh, in, in a way that you might not think. Um, so first of all, the, 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 there are really good reasons why American turnout is low. It's not, not really apathy, I mean, partly apathy, but the reason why Americans don't vote is American governments don't make it easy to vote. In most democracies in the world, in almost every democracy in the world, Governments say, well, we're a democracy. The central act in a democracy is voting. So we should make it easy to vote. Just like you make it easy to pay taxes, you make it easy to vote. And so in some countries, it is mandatory to vote, just like it's mandatory to pay taxes. In most democracies, you automatically become registered to vote when you're 18. You don't have to worry about registration. Nobody goes unregistered. Uh, nobody is not found on the voter rolls. Um, and, and voting is a holiday or a Sunday. So the government makes it easy for you to vote. In the United States, none of those things is true. Governments either are um, sort of, governments are apathetic in terms of helping people vote, or in some cases, they're actually fairly somewhat hostile. Um, so I personally, even though I, I've got a libertarian bent, I have no problem with, a, with mandatory voting. I do not think it is an, a, a, a terrible burden to ask uh, individuals to vote every two years. Uh, I, I, I would love to see mandatory voting or at least um, automatic registration and the distribution of voter of national voter ID cards to everybody automatically by, by the government. Um, if that were the case, there's pretty good evidence. If, if, if we could get turnout to 80% or to 90%, what would that mean? That would mean that a good chunk of Americans who really don't care very much about politics, because they're the ones who don't vote, would vote. These are folks who are, they're not on YouTube watching some crazy whatever, talk about politics every, for six hours a day. They're not necessarily watching um, uh, Tucker Carlson. I guess nobody's watching Tucker Carlson on, on Fox anymore, but th these, are, these are people who are watching baseball uh, or something else. They don't care very much about politics. The benefit of them voting is they tend not to be extremists. They tend to be more centrist, more moderate. And so if they, if they were all dumped into the electorate, it would have a moderating effect on our electorate and it would help, I think, as much as any other reform to depolarize our elections. One last question. Uh, leave us with some optimism. Uh, what do you got for us? That's it. <laughs> Um, I am very hopeful about 
younger generations of Americans. Um, our younger generations, uh, and there's you know, always a lot to complain about about young people, but they are the most ethnically diverse and racially tolerant generation this country has ever produced. Um, they have learned to get along in a diverse society better than any of us. And, um, and they have stepped up to defend a democracy that really is not working very well for them. They stepped up in the last two elections and turned out at uh, not record high numbers, but unusually high numbers. I think that generation is going to consolidate um, multiracial democracy in the United States. Uh, we just need to empower them. Professor Levitsky, I want to thank you for your presentation tonight, staying up late on the East Coast, and uh, it's a great conclusion to this year's uh, program. So just really great to have you with us, and thank you. Um, Thanks very much. It's a real honor to be part of the series. Thank you. And, and, and as I indicated uh, at the beginning of tonight's program, uh, Dr. Levitsky is our last speaker for this year's uh, school year. Uh, those of us who have put in the effort to bring you uh, the speakers hope you have been challenged, engaged, and informed. Over the past three years, you've heard from Eddie Gloud Jr., Ezra Klein, Lawrence Lessig, Janet Napolitano, Jill Lepore, Thomas Mann, Liliana Mason, and Jan Warner Muller, among others. And I don't hesitate to say that this program here at the University of Arizona uh, with our speakers have matched any in the country over the past three years in addressing the challenges to our democracy. Uh, but most of all, I wanna thank all of you who have taken the time over the last three years to participate with us. We've had literally over uh, 4,000 people participate. Uh, you've asked questions, you've challenged our speakers, and you've been part of a community dialogue. Uh, as we move forward, We'll be sure to notify you of our future programs, and it is for those like you who keep the flame of meaningful democracy alive that we do this. Uh, so I want to thank all of you and uh, say good night. Thank you, Dr. Levitsky. Thank you.